she was a 22-year-old visually impaired first-year student at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. She waited for more than an hour for a bus at UA's back gate to get home. She never made it home. What happened to Jasmine Dean? She's been missing without a trace. Jasmine was raised in the parish of St. Thomas. It's in the southeastern end of Jamaica. At the time of her disappearance, she and her family were residing in Bull Bay. Jasmine was the first child for her parents to make it to university, a signal achievement for the family of humble origins. She grew up in an unfinished concrete dwelling surrounded by zinc fence in Bull Bay. Dean, affectionately called Maya, by her family began experiencing difficulties with her sight when she was only two years old. She was later diagnosed with glaucoma. As a student at the University of the West Indies, Jasmine had to commute to school when her father, Lloyd Dean, could no longer afford the fees needed to keep her living on campus. She would take at least three taxis on the journey from Bull Bay to the Mona campus of the university. The estimated travel time, just over an hour. Lloyd is the sole breadwinner of the family. He has been struggling with his four children. Their mother died 15 years ago, but he never abandoned his children. He's been the father who mothered his children. That evening after class, she just told a little more. She always wanted to have the access to the thing because she didn't have no internet at home. So she tried to do most of the things at school after she leaves school. February 27 was one of those nights. Noveen recounts the odd emotions she had the night her sister went missing. I had this feeling about her because normally she just come home and I just say, oh, Maya, come now or so. But that night, no. I don't know, it's like something I tell me, say something wrong. Because out of the blues, I just get up and I say, Where Maya there? I'm going to run go tell daddy, say, Daddy call Maya. Oh, Maya, I come yet. And he call her, but like him credit did finish. So I say, Angel, go tell one call Maya. I'm going to run go down there. And I say, One call Maya. Call no, she no come. Anyway, him call her, and she say, one me in a one taxi, tell Tia call me. It come like taxi did never done move, but at that time there, we na meds nothing, we na expect nothing, na nothing, so we na really pre nothing. I'm here the rules, so what me say, if a taxi did all move fast, move na you know rules or nothing. But as me say, after everything, me really start meds back from them they call, as me say, unexpected, you get what me say? So we na. Listen for pick up for the clues at that time there because we, we don't know where I'm going. So, and she, she saw him calm and everything. And she said, kind, um, calmly to call me. my friend Tia, that time, my soldier friend there. Because most of the time, I even always just go pick her up when she, um, she, know, she can't reach or she can't get transportation on time or something. So, I even go do the picking up most of the time then. And most of the time, she called him available. Lloyd said he called Jasmine three times. 
And although all three calls went unanswered, he wasn't worried. I said, all right, I'm not too bothered because it's private and she doesn't really like the botheration more at the time. Yeah. So I'm just ease her a little bit so and make sure go on. Do her thing, in my mind, still, in my mind, you get what I say? So in my mind, she's on her way to reach up. Worry and panic started to set in as the hours passed and there was no sign of their Jasmine. Theo, Jasmine's on and off boyfriend, had by this time visited the family house to see her. Because I think she reached, because I think she tried to buy something. Because I ate it, I hurt her, I don't know if her menstrual did it on her on a daily or something. Wanna, yeah, I think her, yeah, yeah, she did it on her menstrual. They tell him to buy a pill, he come over here with them, to give her an aspect or what. No more anybody else. So he take my phone and I call her back and advise me. But before I reach, I end up. I call her at the same time, but when I call her, I straight to Vice Mail. But as I reach Vice Mail, I hear Fim Vice. So I say, I must him come with her or something. But he might look for her too. So Tia, come over here now and I say, Wang, but I don't get Maya. Like her phone lock off, then Wang start call back now. And the phone was straight to Vice Mail and say, No, it lock off now for good. That night now, Wang and Daddy, them pay for put gas in a tear car to go look at town, but I just me and Tia alone do. So me and him got town, we go circle the place and I look if we see her, we never see her. I'm sorry, but the person you have called is unavailable. Jasmine's phone kept going to voicemail. The family then realized something was seriously wrong. They called the police's 119 number for help. And we said, feel that it's missing man. And they must say them can't do until 24 hours, is it? So I don't know when we when we say so we can't get them for the none at the time you now. You come like say we up the little fear in the night there. It was a sleepless night for the family. In the morning, Lloyd Dean, Jasmine's father, reported her missing at the Mona police station. She was last seen in Papin, dressed in a white blouse and blue jeans. She has not been seen since. Students of the University of the West Indies, Mona, were out on Friday seeking the public's assistance in locating Dean. It's a sad day for us as university students to know that one of our own has been missing for so long. Uh, without any idea of where she could be. Uh, the torment the family can, is going through right now must be unbearable. Jasmine's disappearance triggered public concerns, which led to a high-level investigation by the police. The director of security at the UWI Mona campus, a former senior police officer, Norman Haywood, handed over the video footage from the university's CCTV cameras. It shows Jasmine standing at the bus stop for more than an hour. She would um, attend classes and would leave at a particular time in the evening accompanied by her friend. She had a friend who both of them would walk together, take bus together. Uh, and this particular Thursday evening, for some reason, uh, her friend wasn't there to accompany her, so she went to the bus stop alone. She would have been at the bus stop for quite some time based on camera footage, and you would have seen the JUTC buses come and go. Mr. Haywood says a vendor at the UWI back gate helped Jasmine to get a taxi. About five minutes past nine, a vendor who sells at the corner would have approached her and later interview with the vendor would have shown that he knew her before and he noticed that she didn't go on any of the buses and he was packing up to leave. So she 
apparently would have been the last person there. So he became concerned and he went and spoke to her and um, he stopped a taxi. The vendor who helped Jasmine into a taxi is Carlton Williams. Jasmine stood at the bus stop for an hour and 16 minutes with no help from anyone. Mr. Williams was the only one who offered her help. The taxi driver later would have said that he was not working anymore. It was just his, his last trip. But he assisted her to Papine. Mr. Williams says he pointed out the taxi to the police the next day. In the next morning, the officer then started to question me about it. The car, if I see it, know the car, I pick her up and find out the car. When the car come on the compound, he said to me, well, call him, I call him and show them the car. So they might tell me what happened. And I said, what? So I guess you understand. She asked, she, we, didn't, we didn't all know that she was blind. You know, it's like, just like the next morning, we know we realize everything. Because if she was blind like we didn't hear them talk about, maybe things are different still. Jasmine's father says he's confused about the help given to his daughter. The youth man said, boy, he might help her. Then, and the taxi man said, he might help her, he not work, but he can't go left her up at the square. I know me can't understand nothing at all with them two men there, say. Because you see a little girl who is disabled at a school gate. Why you move her from the school gate? Why they move her? He's still distraught. That's what I mean, you know. Like for some people, I'm dead already. Something I tell you, ask me, I ask you this to the taxi man that are dead already. I don't cherish to kill people, you know, because I don't cherish them things. You know. But I want my picnic. And the Jews man still I have him see him where because I can't believe you there at a school gate. You go help a child. Eh? I carry her back in at the school. If I go move her, I don't put her up on the taxi. Senior Superintendent of Police, Stephanie Lindsay, says there was no evidence pointing to the taxi driver having any involvement in the disappearance of Jasmine. They were able to identify the taxi man, they searched his community because he's from Mudtown. They went there, they, they did searches on more than one occasion. They took his car, they did DNA sample, they have done all the things, the science didn't show anything. He was released. Still, Jasmine's on and off boyfriend was also questioned and released. According to Theo, he called Jasmine 17 times on the night of her disappearance. None of his calls were answered. Noveen is still questioning why Theo was taken in by the police. It's obvious to them find something, well, like threatening or something, for bringing me in, searching car, take the phone. Can it see if ear or blood or any of them something in there? Them do all of that with film care. I don't know why. Noveen says Theo was one of two men who shared an intimate relationship with Jasmine. She says she saw text messages between Jasmine and a pastor who was linked to a charitable organization in Jamaica. It's like him getting a one problem with a younger girl. It's like him on the church. I'm preacher at the church, a pastor, something like that. I think they were together doing whatever, because like him, I say, him can't do this no more. Jasmine's family says she was very private and wanted to be independent. According to the deans, there were messages on her social media platforms and phone that they still don't understand. 
I saw 78, 79 contact. And I saw a contact with a lot of emoji. I think it was Enoch. But I tried calling the number multiple times and it seems strange that the number no longer works. This number named Kevin, I texted him, he replied and said, sorry about Jasmine and all that. I asked him if he heard from Jasmine and he said, no, he did not, not recently, something like that. So everything was before she went missing. Noveen says she also saw a text between her sister and Theo that their relationship was over. In her phone text, like, Theo must have tell her, say, like, they must can't talk or something like that because the baby mother, jealous. And something, but Maya agreed to that. So that now, me see the agreement. So me never understand how he never reach back. After that, you know, the agreement make, me never see nobody like, you know, he might come now or nothing. And then now, one night, me see him come fear in the car. She says she's going to buy Ronis. From that, me never see she gone and gone and gone and gone again. But me I say I tell you that and I write over the same way. So I couldn't know nothing. But the baby mother know. Me know she no like Maya. Cause she have it for say, a Maya no one let go to you. When Maya have a problem to be by herself. The head of the Constabulary's Corporate Communications Unit, SSP Stephanie Lindsay says the police are continuing their investigations into the disappearance of Miss Dean. Police investigations revealed three cell sites picking her up on the night of February 27, leading to Bull Bay. She usually travel on a JUTC bus that plies the route from Yui to Bull Bay because she resided in, in Bull Bay. Sometime after nine o'clock, her father became a bit concerned because he didn't see her return home. When he made contact with the driver of the bus, he was told that she was not on the bus. So I guess he canvassed the community, made some, some checks and they didn't see her. They eventually got in touch with her, as we were told, that sometime after, after nine, she said she was downtown and was heading home. Our investigators confirmed that at some point during that time, she was downtown because they were talking to her on the cell phone, so they were able to pick up from different cell sites. So they know that between 9.30 and about 10.30, she was between downtown, there was another pic, um, cell site picture up in Arborview and Bull Bay. So the last time there was any contact and any sign of visibility of her, whether through technology or in speaking to her, was about 10.30 on the night of February 27th, and the last location was in Bull Bay. The senior superintendent says the police also did more than 50 search operations looking for Jasmine. We started getting tips from all over the country. They took them to Manchester, where they carry out search in Manchester, St. Anne. They went to um, various locations in Kingston. No trace of her. This investigation it probably is one of the missing person cases that we have put the most resources in. Good morning to all. The purpose of our coming together is to update you on this very important investigation. We have, during our investigation, identified a person of interest in which we are seeking the public support to identify this particular individual and we are asking anyone who may have seen this individual in june 2020 the police charged 40 year old tamar henry otherwise called graf and lavish of bull bay st andrew and 36-year-old Gregory Wright, otherwise called G, in the case of Dean's disappearance. They were found with Jasmine's phone and ATM card.
something so I say from the beginning once you come up with a man like that in a case like this them should have fine with Pitney already you understand because if you have the two man them when we can understand you know you are the two person them with our things them right and where did them they no most can tell you what them know what me know SSP Lindsay says they're hoping someone will come forward to say what happened to Jasmine. They were charged for breaches of the Law Reform Special Transaction Act. They were also charged for breach of the Cybercrime Act. Those are matters that are still before the court, so we don't know the outcome because um, they are they um, they are still allegation based on the findings. So they were charged based on the footage. And um, although the, the, the detectives, you know, believe that they could assist more with her disappearance, but they, they, they were able only to charge them for that. They can't connect her fully with her disappearance or anything else because the threshold of the evidence is not there yet. A question many persons are asking is why? Why was a bus not provided by the university for someone who was visually impaired traveling from Bull Bay to St. Andrew? The Vice President of Properties and Special Initiatives at UE Guild of Students, Kadisha Stewart, says no transportation system is in place for special needs students. Nothing was in place as it pertains to transportation. However, you had volunteers who went to the Office of Students with Special Needs that actually gave their time to actually help academically to accompany them to the back gate to go on whichever transport, assist them with exams for those who are unable to write. Um, you even had an arm of the External Affairs Committee that's known as the Aidability Network that assisted as well. However, due to it being a volunteer system, it was based on volunteers' availability and as such, students weren't always there to assist those who were disabled. Miss Stewart was visibly moved when she heard how long Jasmine was at the bus stop waiting for a bus. To be honest, you can have plans, however, in executing comes a whole different ball game. And then if all the players in the grand scheme of things don't come together, it's difficult. SSP Lindsay says after a year and one day, Jasmine's case will change from a missing person to one of a homicide. We know in law they said that um, after a year and a day of the person's disappearance and based on everything and so on, there can be some presumption. So, but it's a process that they will have to consult with the DPP. They look at everything to see if they get to the point where a presumption can be made that she is not alive, but we don't, we're not there yet. Mr. Dean is still clutching to the hope that his daughter is still alive. Oh, I mean, I think she's dead, you know, I tell you the truth. I don't feel it, though. You know? I don't feel she's dead. Jasmine's sister, Noveen, still has hopes that they'll find her. We just always have to try to have hope that she's out there. I want to mind we just find her all before the 28th or whatever. Jasmine was a beacon of hope for the Dean family. Mr. Dean says Jasmine was a bright girl. She wants to be either a liar or a prime minister. That's what she thinks. She, she's quietly fearing me. She, she doesn't stop nowhere. Because she doesn't want to come work with you. Because she can't have money for, for jump on her. So she said she wants to do her own and end up in her own business or something. Hi, I'm Jasmine Dean and I'll be singing you Rude by Samantha J. 
Woke up this morning, I can't the door. Put a smile on my face. But for my daddy, I wasn't sure. Open the door, and there was my love. So ask him a question. But I had a feeling it would go wrong. wrong. Her brother Lloyd says Jasmine loved music and her books. Yeah, gospel and I R I B and I series and I movie and I book. Is it? Uh, she did bright man. Too much love I book too. She's almost so bright. Sweet. <laughs> At this point, what the family need is closure. They would just love to know that they're at the point where they can say, all right, somebody kept her from the family for a year. It's time to release her back to her family. Whatever the situation is, counseling and everything and support will get her back on her feet. If it's a situation where the unfortunate thing happened, they probably um, killed her or something, come forward and even give an indication, be anonymous, even if we never get to arrest and convict anybody for her death, in the event that is a presumption, at least the family would have closure. I mean, the investigators would have um, not be happy if that's the outcome, but at least we could say at least we can close the case. So it is very um, unfortunate. I mean, with the Jamaica Constabular Force, we get the calls every day. They will come on our anything on Jasmine Dean. We too would like to have a conclusion in this matter. I know that the world was cruel, but I never thought it was this cruel to take up a visually impaired person, realize that she's visually impaired and kept her and killed her, probably possible abuser, and feel nothing. I thought that the world had some form of sympathy towards persons with disability. No one knows that it's safe for no one, no one at all. A year on, pain and grief over the disappearance of Jasmine Dean is still raw. Her family are desperate to find her or to be able to bury her. They need a closure. I even the bone more for my picnic to bury. If I even if I even were left more wanted to bury. But there are some haunting questions. How did her family and the University of the West Indies somehow had a blind 22-year-old female student on her own to find public transport after dark to get home. Why was she left to take her chances to do so in Jamaica's notorious killing fields? If you or anyone you know with any information about what happened to Jasmine, Call us. Thank you for watching Missing Without a Trace. Don't say no. Why you gonna be so rude? I wanna be happy too. Why you gonna be so rude? Be so rude, can't take it no more. And my life not yours. I can't take it no more. And my life not. Yours.